So section four, it's about toward a new horizon in textile exhibition. In this section, we have speakers, Ms. Pamela Parmel, Ms. Liu Xiao, and a talk will be um, moderated by Mr. Kino Jiang. Pamela is currently the chair and curator of David and Roberto Logia Department of Textile and Fashion Arts and oversees the encyclopedic collection of textiles and dresses. Liu Xiao is um, the curator of second Hangzhou Triennial of Fiber Art in 2016. Her research and practice is divided into three parts. One, planning of contemporary art exhibitions. Two, writing articles about social thoughts and long-term and large-scale to independent research projects. Kino is an assistant professor at the uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. His research focused on technologies of physical and chemical treatments of textiles. He opened new routes in improving textile functions and enhancing apparel aesthetic. May I now have Pamela on the stage, please, for the first presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying for this very last session. Uh, before I begin, I would love to thank everyone here at Mill 6, Angelica Lee, Mizuki Takahashi, and Ik Chao, and everyone else at Mill 6 for their hospitality and for inviting me here to participate in this conference. It's also my first trip to Hong Kong, and I've really enjoyed my stay in the city. So I'm very grateful for the invitation. Now, a year before we even conceived of our exhibition, The Museum of Fine Arts Boston inquired, acquired Iris Van Herpen's Anthozoa dress. The dress was from her 2013 Voltage collection. It was a significant acquisition for the museum for several reasons. It was the first 3D printed garment to walk down the Paris runways. And it was made in collaboration with Associate Professor of Media Arts and Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Neri Oxman. The acquisition of the Anthozoa dress marked a new collecting direction for the museum and was also a nod to Boston's important role as a center of high-tech development and industry. The dress also inspired our 2016 exhibition, Textile. The exhibition was curated by myself, Lauren Whitley, Senior Curator of Textile and Fashion Arts, and Michelle Finnamore, Penny Vinick, Curator of Fashion Arts. The three of us wanted to explore several themes in the exhibition, which in included the current kind of fusion of fashion and technology as seen in the work of contemporary fashion designers, as well as the concurrent embrace of fashion by contemporary scientists and technologists. We were also interested in new methods of clothing and textile production, as well as the growing importance of digital media and electronics in the fashion world. In the end, we divided the exhibition into three sections that reflected these goals. The first section provided an introduction to established fashion designers who have included or addressed technology in their work. The second gallery focused on production, and a third was titled Performance. The introduction featured the work of the designers Hussein Chalayan, Issey Miyake, Alexander McQueen, and Ray Kawakubo. Chalayan and Miyake, who throughout their careers have explored new technology and are well known for their innov innovative collaborations. Miyake is celebrated for his innovative work developing new methods of manufacturing textiles and clothing, including the Pleats Please line and APOC, to the more recent developments of the Miyake Design Studio and Reality Lab, including uh, the collections 1325 and 3D Seam Stretch. The 1325 collection was developed in collaboration with the engineer and mathematician June Mitani. He has been fascinated with origami for a long time, which provided the inspiration for the collection. Uh, working together, Mitani and the design studio created a collection of three-dimensional garments which fold into two-dimensional sh shapes. So here you see one dress in its flat form, 
and kind of expanded into the actual garment. We also included work in the exhibition from the 3D steam stretch line. This was a new technique which was inspired by the, both the Pleats Please and APOC collections to create permanent uh, polyester pleating. We all felt we needed to include the work of London-based designer Hussein Chalayan. Chalayan has collaborated with technologists such as Moritz Waldemeyer, with whom he created the first video dresses in 2007, and more recently with animatronics expert Adam Wright to create the Possessed Dress that was featured in a performance section of our exhibition. Chalayan was also responsible for the remote control and airplane dresses, one of which was in the show. He was the first designer to also show his collection by video and not on live models. And he did this in collaboration with Nick Knight, who is a fashion photographer who now runs um, a fashion video film show studio. They created the video readings uh, in 2007. The video introduced the collection, and the collection itself was influenced by celebrity and idolatry. The video ended with a section uh, which showcased Swarovski crystal encrusted dresses that reflected light, laser light back onto the audience. Video was also a key theme in the work of uh, Alexander McQueen, and in particular his famous uh, spring-summer 2012 collection, Plato's Atlantis. The collection also included digitally printed fabrics, such as that on the dress you see from the, on the left, as well as uh, 3D printed shoes. These were designed in collaboration with H.R. Geiger, and some of you may know him as the um, force behind the film Alien, and the, he designed the monster in the film. Uh, McQueen, in collaboration with Nick Knight and his fashion video company Show Studio, intended to live stream the catwalk show. This was the first time a show would have been live streamed online. They installed cameras on large booms, um, which ran up and down the catwalk and focused on both the models and the audience. Unfortunately, an hour before the event, Lady Gaga tweeted to her millions of followers that her new single, uh, Bad Romance, would premiere with the show. This caused so much traffic to show studio server that they crashed it. So unfortunately, the show never did stream. Uh, the final designer in the section um, was Ray Kawakubo, and we focused on her 2012 flat collection. And while Kuba, Kawakubo doesn't really include technology in her work, the collection itself was a, a critique of the growing importance of digital media in the fashion world, and the fact that most people now experience fashion on a two-dimensional screen. Uh, her collection featured two-dimensional garments with bold graphic patterns. Um, they were perfect for display on a flat screen, but not, most flatter, not the most flattering for a three-dimensional body. The introductory space allowed us to present to our audience key fashion designers in the field, but also to reinforce some of our key themes, the idea of collaboration, the impact of digital media, and new methods of production. The section of the exhibition on production explored newer technologies, which have in recent years become standard practice in the fashion world, such as digital printing and laser cutting. We also examined emerging technologies that could transform the way we produce and acquire clothing and accessories. And this included 3D printing, electronics, do-it-yourself, computer modeling, and sustainable technologies used in recycling and manufacturing. To showcase digital printing, we featured the work of Mary Katronsu, and highlighted how digital media has influenced not only fashion, uh, but fashion photography and video. Uh, accompanying her 2012 expanded dress um, was a photo of the dress taken by Eric Madigan Heck, a well-known fashion photographer who often uses digital enhancements in his work. Uh, we also featured a show studio video, which is on the, the left, which was created uh, using 3D animations and it was uh, done by Show Studio to commemorate um, Mary's work, her five-year anniversary. She's a very young designer. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to borrow, uh, whoops, wrong way. Uh, 
any of the dresses with Star Wars imagery that was digitally printed uh, by the California duo Red Darte for their 2014 collection. This section of the exhibition also focused on laser cunning, and one of the highlights was this dress, which uh, was from Giles Deacon's Spring-Summer 2012 collection, made of silver-coated leather, laser cut with delicate lace patterns, and further embroidered, embellished with Swarovski crystals. While digital printing and laser cutting have important places in the exhibition, the first piece you actually saw when walking into the gallery was Van Herpen's Anthozoa dress. It provided an introduction to 3D printing. Van Herpen's garment is notable for the use of two materials in its printing to create both hard, the white acrylic, and black, which is polyurethane rubber textures, in the, and, and this was all done in the same printing. The skirt and cape are both constructed of smaller 3D printed units that were assembled by Van Herpen's team. The, the ensemble did not come right off the printer ready to wear. This was the state of the art in 2013, but the field has progressed rapidly in the last three years. Digitally printed shoes and even dresses can now be pulled right off the printer and worn the same day. One of the most forward-looking garments in the show, and possibly points the way to the future, was the Somerville, Massachusetts-based company Nervous Systems Kinematics Pedal Dress. This dress is composed of 16,000 unique pieces that are interconnected by more than 2,600 hinges. And while it is made of plastic, the small hinged elements create a garment that fits and moves on the body. The dress was digitally printed in three parts that easily snap together. And while the production method is revolutionary, what is more significant is that the buyer can customize the dress with Nervous Systems online design software. The user can alter the shape of the garment by resizing the hinged elements and by choosing their preferred neckline or hem. Once it has been designed, the buyer then feeds in their measurements or a body scan, and a custom design and print dress could be printed right out, printed for them. The innovative 3D garments and shoes of Nervous System, as well as those of the shoes of Francis Betonti, United Nude, and the Young Design Collaborative 3S4, presented our viewers with a look into the one possible future for clothing manufacture. Like Anne Francis in the film Forbidden Planet, who only needed to ask Robbie the robot for a new dress or jewels, and they would be ready to wear the next morning. One can now go to the computer and feed in the information, and the garment is printed ready to wear. The incorporation of electronics into wearables could also be found in this section of the exhibition. We included the work of three designers, uh, Ralph Lorenz's Ricky Bag with Light, Pauline Van Dongen's Solar Dress, uh, both represented functional garments. The hand bag includes a detachable battery charger and light source. When the bag is not in use, the charger can be removed and recharged so that it is ready to and waiting the next day if an emergency cell phone charge is needed. Van Dongen's solar dress provided the same function. The upper bodice is faced with solar panels, and this is the dress on the right. Um, it's, it, and it has the solar panels on the, the shoulders of the dress. And these panels convert light into electricity and a USB port is integrated into the design of the panels and can be used to power or charge a phone. What struck us about the dress when we first saw it was not only its functionality, but its beauty. Wearability and beauty are what also struck us when we discovered Albert Creamler's Autumn Winter 2014 collection for Acris. Creamler worked with Foster Rohner to incorporate their technical embroidery into a series of garments for the runway, each embedded with small LED lights. The swirling embroidery patterns um, incorporated the circuitry that was used to power the lamps. The collection was inspired by Thomas Roof's, Roof's astral-themed photographs and celebrated the company's 10th anniversary of showing their collections in Paris. The tuxedo we chose to exhibit was among the more wearable pieces in the exhibition, and it illustrated how technology, in the hands of the right designer and developer, can be used to create extremely beautiful clothing. The final section in production examines sustainability and recycled, with recycled clothing from the company G-Star Raw for the Oceans, 
and we chose to exhibit a promotional ensemble from their capsule collection designed in collaboration with Pharrell Williams. Uh, the collection incorporated denim, which was made, uh, partially made from recycled plastic bottles that had been recovered from the ocean. The section also looked at the work of Kate Goldsworthy, and we've heard of Kate's name before. She's a senior research fellow at the Textile, Textile Futures Research Center, the university, or Chelsea University. Goldsworthy is exploring, uh, experimenting with laser technology to both pattern and construct clothing. Her work is in its most preliminary stages, but it could have far-reaching effects on the future. The World Bank has estimated that as much as 20% of the world's water pollution is a result of the cloth dyeing and finishing industries. Goldworthy has been experimenting with the use of lasers to pattern cloth and has developed several techniques, such as stenciling and fusing layers to create a range of textures and patterns, such as those you see here. The museum asked Goldsworthy to produce a dress for the exhibition, and the resulting zero-waste dress was designed in collaboration with David Telfer as a closed-loop process. Produced and finished using laser technology, the garment remains 100% polyester and can easily be recycled due to the fact that no other materials or chemicals are present. Telfer's zero-waste patterns and the garment's minimal seaming also conserve resources. In the section titled Performance, we explored clothing that interacted with the wearer in both practical and conceptual ways. The work of six artists were included in this section. Iris Van Herpen, Ying Gao, The Unseen, Hussein Chalayan, Cute Circuit, and Victoria Modesta. Van Herpen's crystallization dress, which is seen on your right, was a collaboration with Nick Knight, Show Studio, and Daphne Guinness. And the ensemble from Ying Gao's Incertitude Collection both represented work of artists who expressed themselves through clothing and technology. Van Herpen's PET plastic dress was inspired by black and white water splashed onto Guinness's nude body, which was then captured with high-speed video camera. The artist then chose a still from the video and recreated the garment by manipulating clear and black plastic with a heat gun. Ying Gao also incorporates an element of performance art in her designs. Her kinetic garment responds to noise in the environment. Electronic sensors react to the sound of a nearby voice and activate the dressmaker pins covering the surface. This causes them to move and flux in waves. The surprising motion points to Gao's interest in expressing ideas about the modern experience through the use of technology and fashion. According to Gao, both the spectator as well as the wearer engage in a curious conversation, quote, filled with misunderstanding and uncertainty, end quote. Chalayan's possessed dress also explored the influence of outside forces on the human body. Chalayan designed the dress for the dance Gravity Fatigue performed by Sadler's Wells Ballet in November 2015. It was controlled by robotics and moved independently of the dancer. According to Chalayan, the garment represented the innate powers of a dress can have to influence and reappropriate the behavior of the wearer. While Chalayan's possessed dress moved independently of the wearer, Cute Circuit's MFA dress, which was a commission by the museum, was controlled by the wearer, or in our case, by the visitor. Using LED technology controlled by an app on the iPhone or iPad, the wearer could change the pattern of the garment. Francesca Rosella and Ryan Genz of Cute Circuit have developed technology that allows them to incorporate as many as 10,000 LEDs into their garments without using wires so that the clothing remains pliant and drapes well on the body. The museum commissioned the MFA dress and worked with the designers to develop video sequences. One of the most effective images was that of Hokusai's wave, which moved around the dress in one seamless motion. The dress represents the t-shirt of the future, allowing the wearer to express their moods, politics, artistic preferences, and emotions, all by the tap of a button. The final display in the gallery featured the work of Lauren Bowker of The Unseen. There we go. Bowker is interested in chemistry and a textile designer by training, and she opened her own design firm in 2012. The group's products feature inks developed by Bowker that are sensitive to a range of external forces, which cause them to change color. 
The ink was originally developed to detect CO2 in the atmosphere. It was used to dye a jacket, which, when worn outdoors, changed color as the amount of CO2 in the air changed, a visual manifestation of pollution in the atmosphere. Exhibited were two pieces from her 2015 air collection, the bird and the beetle. And you see the bird here. And the bird changed color in response to um, air currents, while the beetle changed color in response to humidity, light, and temperature. I'd like to close t this presentation uh, with the work of an artist who we felt really embodied the spirit of the current fusion of fashion and technology, Victoria Modesta. Modesta, who is self-described as a multimedia artist, model, and bionic woman, suffered a leg injury at birth. Plagued throughout her life, she decided to have her leg amputated below the knee. What some would call a disability, she has embraced. Her prosthesis have become an extension of her persona and the ultimate fashion accessory. She is also a fellow at the MIT Media Lab and is working with Hugh Hare and the Biomechatronics Group to develop prosthetics that merge human physiology with electromechanics. I'd like to conclude with a segment of one of Modesta's videos. This was featured in the exhibition along with the spike prosthesis. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience for such a long day. And I would like to appreciate invitation from Angelica and Mizuki, especially Mio6, uh, because we actually collaborated in September already in our Hangzhou Triennial of Fiber Art for the symposium Textile Thinking. Mio6 is our collaborator. And we also have a long day symposium that day. So it reminds me that very productive, and uh, I believe everyone benefit from that day too. So it's today. So today um, in the morning when I uh, get to the lobby and meet met all the speakers, immediately I think I should change the topic I should talk today. Because in the beginning I said the topic is textile thinking because um, for the last three years, I devoted all the time to the triennial fiber art. Uh, it's called weaving and we. And in the morning, I found actually I should not talk about that because I'm the new person in this field. And our in our panel, the topic is towards a new horizon. So I would like to talk about what is new. Um, so Hangzhou Triennial Fiber Art is. Uh, was established in 2011. And the first edition was in 2013, is curated uh, by Janice Jeffries and the other two curators from China. And uh, when they sent me an invitation to curate this show, I was very curious about why they chose me. Because actually, I'm not a fiber art person. I'm not a textile art person. I'm not even uh, textile person. But I think maybe today when I um, review the whole process, I think probably because I'm the new. 
And this is a lobby of the triennial. Every day, the exhibition receives 3,000 audience to experience in the Zhejiang Art Museum. This exhibition actually is a collaboration between an art academy and a provincial uh, art museum. So probably you know uh, Hangzhou is a city of um, city of silk and the city of uh, Chinese painting and calligraphy, which is very famous. And you know when they really uh, a provincial museum decided to take an modern art. Uh, contemporary art exhibition in like their how to say every three year event, it really needs ch um, how to say power and the energy to do that because they doesn't know anything how to re really functioning in contemporary art exhibition, especially like this one and especially fiber art is also new in China. So on new, what I would like to talk is I. I will start from Weaver because in the beginning, when I proposed to the ac academic committee is that I will say fiber art and the textile art in the field of contemporary art is quite like the st strategy of artist. And the academic committee said, no, you could not do this topic. We are trying to establish a totally fiber art triennial. You came up and told us you want to deconstruct it. So I have to change. So uh, the idea is it, it doesn't know about wave. So my start point is I have to start. Uh, I have to study what is wave and what is weaving. And uh, this is my first class. I study with Sheila Hicks. I just sent her an email said Sheila, I would like to visit you. She said just come on and uh, stay with me. So I stayed with her for several times, every time a week or something. And, and uh, we've together with her mm -hmm. every day. She's very hard working from day with and night. Before, uh, she uh, yeah, the, uh, um, before she went to the before she went to the studio in the early morning, we woke a little bit. Yes, try. And after holding the studio we we uh, went back to her department. We will we've we woke together before our dinner. So this is my first class. And uh, what is new? And I would like to say the weaving class is my first step. And the second step is a new weaving map for me. Um, I would like to mention this picture is a work by Chen Jieren, a Taiwanese artist, my favorite artist. This picture uh, was, uh, is a work by him in 2005. Is called Factory. Um, the, she, uh, he invited all the female workers uh, back to the factory which bankrupted seven years ago. And all the um, female workers' performance with no needle, with no thread in hand, but they have to performance like they are still working in that factory. Actually, that factory has already locked it up for seven years. And you know how, and this whole movie is very, is silence. And in between when the workers are performing in this uh, factory, and uh, mm, he just insect, uh, inserted some clips of the factory video he, he found in, of, about the factory in Taiwan in 1950 and 1960. Um, I, I also would like to thank Edwin Kurt in the morning. He just showed the picture of the mills in Hong Kong. Actually, um, we know that after Hong Kong and Taiwan, all the textile production actually moved to mainland of China, like in Guangdong province. And I also marked the Zhejiang province and the Jiangsu province. Zhejiang is a province of the birthplace of Alibaba, and the Jiangsu province is a place for uh, em embroidery. Actually, we all know that Hangzhou is very famous for their silk. Actually, um, all, Jiangsu is also the place for the uh, silk production and embroidery. And I also, that is, uh, 
um, map for me is a kind of map of history of the production moved. And this map is about the my curatorial map of where is the position of the Hangzhou Triennial. Uh, the blue point is Hangzhou, the place. And around it, there are several towns uh, in Zhejiang province. The Anji is a town of bamboo weaving. Xuchun, you see the picture is taken by Janice. She's the uh, artist in our triennial. Uh, these pictures were taken by her in 2013 in Hainin. And also the Da Tang, the very interesting name town, is a town of socks. You know, the whole China, probably 90% of socks were produced in this town. And uh, so the, in the world, up, I, I assume about 60%, probably we are all wearing the socks from there. And this is a town of Keqiao. Keqiao is a place where it has very heavy pollution, water pollution. And this place, every two years, it will have very huge um, textile trading fair. And you know, some Indian people even moved, migrated to this small town to stay there just for the textile business. And, but in Hangzhou, we also know some important points, like the earliest silk uh, textile is found in Liangzhu. And uh, you know, we, we someone, some of us want to buy a men's scarf. Probably some of the raw material is from Wesley. It is a company produce scarf and silk uh, in Hangzhou. And then we, there's a Yuan Tai family. It did the silk trade for at least 200 years in Zhejiang province. Actually, this is a kind of the point start point of my curatorial work, um, not only uh, from the core of weaving the technique itself, but also from the social relationship of the weaving industry. So, and another point I would like to mention is, because in the beginning I mentioned the neoliberation, um, neoliberation Global globalization trade, and then it is about the history of China modern production field dated back 30 years ago, and this one will be a different one. He's called Marian Wambanov. He's a Bulgarian guy. He came to China in 1950, and then came back to China in 19, uh, 1980, and established the first fiber art or tapestry studio in Hangzhou in our academy. And he's the first one who teach not painting or sculpture in bronze sculpture in China. He brought the soft sculpture, it, the new, new thing in, in Hangzhou, especially in 1985, you know. In, in 1985 is a year of the whole Chinese artist uh, have a great important event. They, after that, it brought out important contemporary artists and uh, important uh, researchers. So as you may know their name already. So he is also inputted an important uh, idea in that time from Hangzhou. And also in 1987, they have an exhibition in Hong Kong Art Center uh, the exhibition called A State of Transition, and uh, Wambanov also brought the works of weaving and tapestry from Hangzhou, and uh, sometime, sometime we saw, we said it is also the first time they show their work outside mainland China. So this is also another clue. So for me, uh, if I face this so uh, abundant information of weaving and tapestry in China, and also the uh, important position in history in Hangzhou and its um, department and its artists and history, what I can do in 2016. Because we know in Losang Biennial, Bayern, it's closed in 1994. It is that because the soft culture or textile art didn't 
uh, couldn't attract uh, enough audience and uh, make this system functioning, so they closed it. And uh, in 1971, in Mormon, uh, there was an exhibition called Beyond Craft. And what, what is, be, if beyond, and what is that? And what is beyond over there, what we can see? And now it's already 40 years later. If we do an exhibition in Hangzhou, what new things we can bring? So I just started my, um, how do you say, uh, experiments to testing what they can accept and also what new things I can bring in this exhibition. And this is a minimum by Sheila Hicks. I worked to together with her. Uh, and we showed 30 small minimums in, uh, in Hangzhou. It, normally, she showed 77 together, which is collected by different collectors. So this time, we just showed 30. Uh, which one she still kept in her hands and she wove in the summer I spent with her. And this one, I, I think I should remark her experience on color. She studied with Joseph Albus, the master of colors. And so this is, color is something sometimes we neglect or forget in an art exhibition, especially when we especially to the, how to say, video exhibition, cartoon exhibition. And the color is something, the most basic thing sometimes we forget. And the other thing is the material she used. You know, this is the cherry branches we ate together. And uh, she also used uh, the newspaper about the Trump election. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you use a feather and the, the bean. So I want to, and this is, uh, she called it the weaving diary, which is a daily practice, actually. And the so daily practice, when we say it in weaving, sometimes we also say it in calligraphy. And uh, you see, now, nowadays, we found less and less things we, we can see we do the daily practice. And this is the work she collaborated with Guatemala's workers, and uh, the workers lost their job already. And so there is a foundation just to reunion the workers and collaborated with Sheila to produce new huge tapestry. This one is uh, it's just an enlarged uh, small panel. It's only 30, centi uh, centi centi 30 centimeters big. And uh, now we show it in Hangzhou. And then we, we also noticed some uh, artists also took the flag, the soft material as their advantage. Like Heidi Voigt, she wove the uh, dead countries flags by the rubbish bags. It's plastic. And it took 500 years to degradation. And actually, the countries now have already died for less than around 15 years. And then we also, sometimes we hope to show an exhibition, something people are not only staring at. You know, when you go to a museum, you found everything we saw is uh, visual art. I hope sometimes I think, actually fiber art should take the advantage of the art you can touch and the work you can be in it. So this is, um, group of designers from Croatia and uh, Austria, and they produced the very huge um, net installation in the museum. Every time it can have at least 10 audience staying in this place. And uh, they really use very cheap and uh, convenient material. The net is for the soccer playground. And uh, the rope actually is uh, just a very normal rope. If we use a chemistry uh, way to connect the net, actually it doesn't hold so heavy things. But actually they connect, the, connect all the nets and ropes by a very physical way. So it is very, very strong and can hold in very heavy things. And it became a structure. And this one is, uh, is by uh, Yong Hao Chang. He's an architect. 
And actually, this is something uh, the architects took the idea of weaving, the structure of the weaving to produce uh, arch. Actually, you see this arch actually only took two days, 10 volunteers to, to finish. And uh, he did quite a lot of experiments in it and used normal paper, clip, and sometimes the wooden stick. And uh, for this, for the soft material textile and into a huge installation, he did quite a lot of research how to hang it, how to make the paper stand, using the uh, folding to make the whole installation stand it for whole months. And then I will also want to introduce this work is by Liu Wei. We all know Liu Wei is, um, how to say, he lives in a place called in between the, pla uh, the place in between the city and the countryside. And actually the canvas is something every day he saw in that area. And normally we do the, how do you say, um, fiber art show or textile show, we saw the work very flappy or difficult to hand, sometimes change a lot. And the, but this time I found Liu Wei's idea on the canvases actually create very monumental installation and also we say sculpture by softer material. And this one, he used, uh, used the green land, the green floor. Actually it's a floor, very normal floor in factories. And the other new thing I want to input is the art places. What is art places? Actually we knew, we say Hong Kong, no, not really Hong Kong. Probably we, I will say Beijing, Shanghai, New York, London is the center of art worlds. <laughs> but if we mirror, if I could not help wondering if we dare to mirror the word, the art word by fiber art or textile art, probably we can receive the word in a very different perspective. This one is uh, by um, um, uh, Kana, for African artist, uh, Dunker and uh, uh, her his sister that showing the cloth her mother collected. The clothes are produced by Netherlands, and uh, the women in Kana actually they uh, they are so proud if they have quite a lot of uh, printed clothes clothes from the Netherlands. And her mother is telling the stories of the patterns uh, when she decided to take this cloth in her collection. It's a symbol of the wellness. And this one is by a Mexico, Mexican artist. He, she based in Osaka and uh, normally worked, only worked with weaver in the mountain. And uh, when she was so surprised when she received my invitation because I asked to do a, how to say, a huge work in the outside space because I know the, during my not too much research in this field, in their cloth in the Osaka in the mountain, the South America, they can produce uh, fabrics very natural, use, using the natural material, but they can waterproofing and uh, keeping the warm has very best um, aspects of the textile. And uh, so they decided to uh, move the symbol of the Maya civilization, the symbol, into our garden. And this one, this work is produced by a, prin it's a, by a princess. She's really a princess in Taiwan, in Hualien. The uh, she only used a coconut, fi coconut fiber and the tree, uh, the tr skin of the trees and the song, I don't know how to say that in English. Uh, it is a water map of her hometown. You know that in, in, in Taiwan, there are small um, minorities living in the mountain or quite near the, uh, quite near the sea. So actually they moved quite a lot because they, they are very fragile to protect their home. And as a princess, she has 
uh, she's the royal family. She has to take the um, take the whole family, take the whole plan to conquer the disaster or some things. And uh, sometimes weaving is kind of the um, tools of her doing this, her princess job. And uh, before this work, I never know. Uh, North Ireland is a place uh, which have best quality of linen. And this is by uh, Lightsia Twanton. And because of troubles, many people lost their lives. And uh, Lightsia just collected the linen uh, things and asked the community to embroider it, the people, the family who lost their life in the troubles. And also, sometimes a community person, some one of them, decided to took their hairs and also uh, embroider it on this. And uh, this one is uh, is by a um, uh, filmmaker. Uh, it is a worm. It's from Bar it's from quite near Russia, and this place actually looks like dated back in 1990s. But actually, this film is was took in 2013. Actually, it's quite not that long. But it's quite like the factory stays in that moment forever, just like staying in 1990s. And this one, this work is, uh, is by Xu Jiang and Yuan Liujun. This work, uh, these machines are from the, the Sox town. And because they are rebuilding the hometown, they just uh, took all the old machines out of their factories. And the artists just grabbed them back and uh, do the work. And uh, this one is uh, took the idea of weaving. That the, uh, when you're st standing in the machine, and the scanner can see your face, and also can test the color and the uh, and the, how to say, the kind of pattern on your body, your upper body. And it will become a kind of uh, information crowd. So everyone who stared, standing there will become a spot with your information, the machine scanned it, and you will become a, a start in a very huge net of the, uh, of the audience. So I, I think for me, the new thing became more and more clear because we see the how to involve the idea of weaving in the, in the exhibition. And we started also to take the uh, new style, like the, you can touch the work and really involve the, um, sometimes you can, you are forbidden to touch and you can, you can do it in the exhibition. So we bring this some kind of new thing, but makes the museum very headache because they do not know how to protect all the works now. So this one is the um, art, new art places, new art, new way of uh, doing the exhibition. And this, uh, the last thing I want to mention is the new world. Is I just want to make a, make a, how to say um, retrospect back to the beginning and when I received the invitation on the topic of this symposium is about the women uh, women women and uh, this picture re remains in my mind for quite a long time. It is um, the woman sat there. Her name is Wang Xuede. The picture was taken by. Uh, uh, a photographer, his name is David Crook, and uh, he is a commun loyal communist person. Um, he is British, and then he went to Spanish, devoted his um, passion in the Spanish Civil War. And then but he found he didn't achieve it, and then he went to Russia. Actually, in the beginning, he was sent to China as a spy. You know, the George Orwell's uh, 1984, uh, in, the front, in the front page, it is said, to my friend. The friend is 
David Crook. David Crook is inspi uh, inspiring him that time. And uh, when David came to China, and but he found this is a place where he can really achieve his idea and dream of communism. So he stayed and married uh, a girl, but uh, he's a Canadian, but he's a uh, daughter of a uh, um, daughter of a chef or something. And they really, uh, how to say, joined the army and uh, in the land reform activity. And this is a place in Hebei province. It's called 10 Mile Inn. And we recorded the whole event by camera and the diary. It is that this woman, she had a very sad life um, because uh, her, she, her father used to have a wee textile workshop. And, uh, but one day, her father was uh, wearing a light blue suit in the street. And the Japanese thought his father is um, the Eighth Army. So he shoot his her father, and uh, she and she, in her husband's home, the the mother-in-law normally is not well treated the daughter-in-law, mm -hmm. so she decided to abandon the family, and so he became the first very loyal person in the in this uh, village. They believe in the Communist Party can change their life, so in the land form activity, because Wang Xuede has the skill of weaving, so they appointed her as the chairwoman of the co-op. And she will teach, she will teach all the uh, female in that village to weave, to do clothes, and to provide it to the uh, communist army to really conquer the enemy. So, this time, for me, the new in this case is not only the women got his position um, by weaving, but also it is a transition of a whole period uh, which allowed the people which have the, have the ability or skills to really enter a new world. I don't know whether new is good or not, but I, I will use the word new. So what is new in the end is actually what we are seeing just now is, for me, when it retrospective, is quite typical museum works. Uh, sometimes it brings new, some topics we haven't talked yet in an exhibition in the context of fiber art. If we say it's in the context of contemporary art, actually some of them have the total um, topic and rely on the post-colonialism topic. But if in fiber art, sometimes it brings new things, something we haven't touched upon yet. And then the other new thing I want to, um, I want to infer here is, I have to read it because it's quite long, uh, a little bit long. So in the past decades, we talk about quite a lot we talked a lot on art creation, and uh, people always thought we were already very difficult to have new art forms because we always see the similar works, similar logic, similar character, and also some you can see that they use a similar, quite similar material and a similar presentation. Actually, in the contemporary art um, context, we already found there's quite a lot of things, con uh, quite a lot of things unsatisfy us, and we actually we are not happy to see the loss of the sense of history, and uh, lost the sense of development, and because this idea actually is quite quite close to the uh, art creation, and if we we try to take the people from the, the idea of development. It's quite like the uh, trump of the contemporary new lifestyle. We are trying to abandon the totally old and the traditional lifestyle and which dominant our uh, living world and conquer the reality and make it into a very ideal 
narration or very formal narration, but we we know that it is not the um, it is not the life of the real art. Sometimes it really make us bored, and um, for us, probably the art, the lively art, is something ongoing. When we are in the museum and the, the audience actually control their viewing time, so even online we control everything. And but but now the the fiber arts which presented us something new is something you have to be in the museum to touch, something you have to be there to experience. And this is the only secret thing we can do in the exhibition. Because the Bible already said, the God is already said, nothing is new in, in the sunshine. So because the museum has too many basements to keep in the work, I hope this um, how to say? I hope this place without sunshine and which still allow the uh, experiments of curatorial to make the art lively happen. So thank you. First, uh, thanks very much uh, to Mayor Six for inviting me to participate in this section uh, as a moderator. I'm Keno Jiang. Uh, I'm working at the Polio. Uh, I'm a chairman of the Resource Center and the Institute of Textile and Clothing. Uh, we have uh, established a uh, uh, the fashion gallery in 2009. Uh, we are lonely many years. Um, Hong Kong is a, a metropolis, a lot of a gallery and uh, several museums, but absent the textile and the fashion museum and the gallery. So I'm very excited. Mayor Six established in uh, 2000. So last year, uh, uh, very congratulations. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to join the together working with uh, uh, Pamela and uh, Liu Xiao, uh, two curators. Uh, they gave the excellent presentation already. Uh, we learned a lot of things and the messages. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, like a dialogue. Uh, First, uh, I think Pamela, uh, we have, uh, uh, I visited the uh, uh, Museum of Fine Art in Boston in 2004. I visited the museum and uh, uh, very hap happened to visit the exhibition of uh, Makiko Minagawa's collection uh, in the museum. Uh, so I'm very happy to meet uh, the uh, Pamela, about the, today, and now she is the curator of the exhibition. So I knew you <laughs> many years ago. So I want to ask you, um, as your background is not the uh, only curator of the textile and the fashion you present, you said you curate everything like uh, art. So in your experience, uh, what's the difference uh, between the common artwork and the textile and the fashion uh, exhibition in your experience? Thank you. Let's see, I worked, well, right now at the Museum of Fine Arts, I work with an encyclopedic collection that goes across time. My previous job was at the Rhode Island School of Design and I had a very similar collection. So I have the pleasure of working with many, you know, studying many different cultures, many different textile types. Um, but it's also, um, in a sense, a burden because I don't have the time to go into depth in any one area. Um, but I've always felt that the collections I work with, textiles, fashion, are uh, design collections, that they're objects that have a purpose, they have a function 
um, outside of being beautiful, there's also that functionality to them. So for me, they're slightly different than a painting or a sculpture or something you put on the wall. And that's how I've always really appro approached our collection as design. Uh, how about uh, the different uh, with uh, the high technology uh, e uh, material and the results with the fashions? How, how to treat it like a, a very good presentation idea, if you have? Well, if you look at the history of textiles and fashion, they've often been at the cutting edge of technology in the 19th century and the 18th century. So it's really not that different today than it was in the past. There's, there's always been high technology involved in both fashion and textiles. Thank you. Uh, I also visited uh, the 2016 uh, triennial uh, fiber art in Hangzhou. Uh, I know the exhibitions uh, very shocked. I really loved the exhibition and idea. I received the inspiration and to for my work for the creation work. So, uh, Liu Xiao, can you? introduce your uh, team's idea and the philosophy. Uh, what's the, the aims of the exhibition? Because this is uh, the second time of the triennial. I also visited uh, the first time and participated in the opening. So what's the uh, difference between the first? What's the progress uh, from number one and two? Uh. Actually, the first, I think I would like to also ask Janice, which is the difference between the first version and the second. Uh, because for me, the uh, generally speaking, uh, if I see an uh, exhibition like Fiber Art Triennial, which established in 2013, and for me, the second one should deeply, how to say, to really uh, de try to explore one topic of this field very deeply because the first version for me is more general to introduce the fiber art, very important, some the monumental works to the audience in Hangzhou. But for me, it, the second one is I have to take the advantage of media and uh, also my experience in general contemporary art world to... Um, to more, to much more explore the topic of why we do fiber art today, because this is something almost forgets since 19, 1990s around for our generation. But I know quite a lot of people uh, which worked with uh, with me, they are they still have the memory and they are still uh, encouraged by the uh, fiber art world yesterday. But for me, it's, that's yesterday and this is today. Why I do this for today? So that's why I put the map here. And I think fiber art is very different from the general contemporary art because um, it's quite like ceramics. You know, ceramics also have the um, production industry to support. And I believe fiber art also should have such background. And you know, in Hangzhou, it is a place of uh, have quite a lot of textile um, industry, but we actually the art and the society is disconnected. So my aim, sometimes I want to reconnect them. That's why I do the, I chose a topic weaving. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, about the uh, fiber art, if we call the, the artwork, uh, we should consider the market like uh, art, uh, uh, the collection, something, the value. And it's different than like uh, market of the products, textile and the clothing. So in this area, do you know any uh, the potential market like uh, uh, art value of the fiber uh, results, uh, if any, the case, mm. based on your experience? Uh, so far, as in my interviews for two years, and uh, I talked with many museums, actually preservation is still the problem of fiber art. Actually, you cannot uh, let the work last forever. It's quite, quite difficult. 
And because I, I, I try to learn the work and the albums, the six panel, uh, amazing tapestry. And they say, okay, we can lower it, but we have to check the condition. But when they open it, they just told me the situation is too bad. This is something that I think, um, for me, I think collector also have the doubt on, on that. If someone want to collect something forever, it is still a problem. But I think for me, the market, I haven't, I haven't really explored that. But for me, the design and art, like I talk, I also because. I'm only 13, and uh, I also asked some people 80, 70 on the question, design, value, art. I think everyone is trying to, uh, how to say, stay and uh, keep their position in uh, very art and uh, very design part. I think still trying, and the, the gap in between, I still could not tell exactly, honestly, yeah. So as a curator, we should consider the exhibition has uh, the, uh, some results, collection record, and education, or report some developments. <clears throat> so in the Boston Museum, uh, do you have any collection of the uh, textile design or fashion designs uh, uh, in your museum collection, in your museum? Uh, the Textile Fashion Arts Collection. Yeah. We have about 50,000 pieces. Oh, yeah. a huge <laughs> number. Oh. It's, some are fragments, very small, but it's a very big collection. The museum started collecting when it was first founded in um, 1870s. So it's, we've been collecting for more than 100 years. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I, I thought uh, um, in uh, Hong Kong, uh, we have uh, the fashion gallery. And now we uh, we very happy has uh, the sister is the male six with the textile, and we may have a potential to develop the, in the future like the museum collection. I I think Hong Kong is not only the traditional like a uh, 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 or something is uh, or traditional. I think Hong Kong has a, uh, a rich source of the high fashion brand and uh, developed uh, um, uh, high-tech uh, fashion end. So potentially, we have uh, uh, the future. Uh, so finally, can, can you two curator uh, figure out any potential in the future, like uh, uh, textile design and the fiber art in the future? Uh, any ideas? Uh, or develop the predictions for yeah, the future. Yeah, the potential. <laughs> I'll leave that to the makers. <laughs> uh, futures, I I could not help, but I, I think after the exhibition, more and more curators and uh, artists just uh, pay attention to soft the textile, the material. I think this is for sure, and. Uh, um, one of my friends actually just opened a textile library. It's called Tab Textile Library. And he, she's functioning it like um, a social enterprises. It's non-benefit, and uh, they can have artists. He, she, she invited artists and designers working with her, and her uh, production line can open to the artist and designer. I think this is kind of something new. I. Uh, I think we found the our topic weaving and we the we and from the exhibition something is coming up. We found people are doing the same things and towards uh, same horizon. <laughs> yeah, I, I would I agree with that. I think a lot of these boundaries that we set up, especially in museums, are really tumbling down. Um, I was telling someone our conservation lab is seeing more and more contemporary art people that pieces that include fiber in some way or another. So. I think this, this is all very artificial and will change and over time. Uh, I, I agree your uh, two suggestions. I think this is a very uh, crisis time to Hong Kong. The production uh, move out to Guangdong, other provinces in mainland, and to Africa. 
I think uh, Hong Kong maybe is uh, uh, need to rethink what's the position, the position of the textile and the, the fashion, and also to consider Hong Kong is a, a design center, how to become it. So we we uh, we should think everybody even to think about this future. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I think we give some uh, a few minutes to audience. So any uh, question from uh, uh, Flora? So I believe this uh, special section in Hong Kong, we have a lot of uh, discussion in fashion show and uh, fashion design, but the textile exhibition is number one, I think, in Hong Kong. <laughs> okay. Any question? Any question, Flora? To uh, the curator's presentation. One more question.